Well, Sycamore Canyon, Hackberry Basin, in-depth ceramic analysis began actually as an afterthought. The survey of Hackberry Basin, Sycamore Canyon initially began as a hilltop survey for Dr. David Wilcox and permission from Peter Pillis, a Forest Service archeologist to conduct the survey on the Coconino National Forest was sought and granted. He also requested that any sites encountered be recorded. Jerry Earhart, with the help of members of the Verde Valley Archaeological Society, began the survey around 2003, and the main objective was to locate line of sight between pueblos. The secondary objectives was locating and recording prehistoric trails and historic roads. This map shows our survey area, which was south of Flagstaff and east of Camp Verde in the Verde River, uh, north of Childs, and west of Strawberry and Pine. And I know everyone has seen this map. Uh, our survey study is actually a work in progress, and the focus uh, on areas most likely to include prehistoric sites and line of sight opportunities. The areas not surveyed will be done in the future, hopefully, if we don't get too old and fall over. <laughs> our, our preferred goal was to analyze at least 100 shirts per site if they were available. I developed this recording sheet to allow for more details about the pottery, lithic materials, and ground stone than was required on the site cards. Important facts such as, was it a bowl, jar, rim, body piece, uh, this was then the basis for all the in-depth interpretation of the survey. Included in our field procedure is to break a small snip of each sherd and then using a 10 power loop to identify the sherd type, whether it was slipped, unslipped, bowl, jar, and record those. If a sherd could not definitely be identified, then the small snip would be photographed just like it is next to the larger snip and collected for confirmation by Peter Pillis. Sites were categorized using the same divisions as the Coconino National Forest. They were categorized also into its temporal phases. Our results were then entered into an Excel database for tabulation purposes. We visited 300 sites, 106 had no datable pottery, 23 with no artifacts at all, 15,000 sherds were analyzed, and 112 different pottery types were identified. The wide range of intrusive pottery found verifies the area was not isolated but had robust interaction with different cultures and those are some of the intrusive pottery that we had gotten both decorated and non-decorated. Of all the decorated ware, the most common was Tucson white ware followed by little Colorado white ware. But the dominant ware varies according to the temporal phase and we'll go into that. Most of the pottery indigenous to the Verde Valley was represented, that's some of the pottery that types. The most common brownware in the survey was Tuzagut followed by Verde. For the less common types of the indigenous pottery, we found no pattern that clustered them around a specific geographic location. They were found ra randomly distributed in the survey area. The non-decorated sherds analyzed were primarily jars. The ratio of jars to bowls was 83% uh, jars and 17% bowls. And, uh, and on the blue, those were the intrusive, and, and they're almost the same, uh, almost mirrors the, <clears throat> the local types as far as bowls and jars. There is a diversity of types of non-decorated plainware in the survey area. And researcher Kathleen Henderson postulated date ranges for young, sunset, Chavez, and Kinnikinick types. That allowed dating the sites with those pottery types. We took advantage of this fact to help date some sites. It is interesting to note that the ratio of decorated jars to bowls is 21% jars and 79% bowls. And that's the exact opposite of intrusive plain wares, which is 22% bowls and 78% jars. And this, we're still working on conclusions for this. These are the time phases that were chosen for this study uh, with the help of Peter Pillis. 
uh, note that each phase does not include the same number of years. To adjust for the difference, I divided the phases into generations, where 25 years equals one generation. For example, early Hanaki phase lasts 125 years. That would equal five generations. Now I had a way to normalize the data for estimating the number of rooms per phase and thus estimating our population. White wares were the dominant trade wear up to 1300 AD. This slide shows the distribution of the decorated wares through the first five time phases. The dominant pottery varies by phase. For example, in the first two, you see Tusian white ware was the dominant uh, decorated pottery, and then late Camp Verde Hanaki, we have little Colorado, followed by late in late Hanaki phase, Tusian white wares became dominant again. Comparing our last two phases, early and late Tuzigut, Winslow orange ware was dominant in early Tuzigut, and this changes to Jedido yellow ware in late Tuzigut phase with some white mountain red ware. Notice how few decorated sherds even remain in the late Tuzigut phase, only 23 versus 51. In fact, all these sherd types could be assigned to the early Tuzigut phase as their date range it actually extends time-wise back into early Tuzigut time frame, begging the question, was anyone home in late Tuzigut phase? We categorized the survey sites according to time phrases by dating the pottery found at the sites. They were then plotted on maps for each phase using their GPS coordinates. The symbol in black on all the following maps represent the sites present in that phase. The letters in red and the symbols in white are positions of sites with no datable pottery, and we'll see this throughout. During the cloverleaf phase, the sites are widely spaced by the black dots there, black symbols. However, all sure types assigned to this phase can mark the beginning of the following phase. Any use of the study area during the clover leaf time frame remains uncertain. And the following maps uh, will illustrate how sites increase, cluster, and finally decrease through time. Okay, uh, this is the Lake Camp Verde phase map, and the Data showed growth in the number of sites. You can see that uh, at both the size of the sites and the number, which indicates people from other areas are coming into this relatively unoccupied area to exploit its good resources. Because of warm weather and better than average precipitation along the Colorado Plateau and Mogollon Rim, the people could expand into the higher areas. We have identified an increase in Tusian grayware at this time. If you look at this chart and compare the number of sites, 44 to 45, you would say that the number of sites remained relatively stable between phases. But after adjusting for the number of generations per phase, six generations in early Camp Verde and two generations in late Camp Verde, there is a definite increase in, excuse me, in population in the late Camp Verde phase. During the early Honanki phase, the total number of sites increases. This should not be surprising because during this time, the same thing was happening in other parts of the Puebloan world. It had been shown that there was an increase in population in four geographic areas, Flagstaff, Verde Valley, Wapaki, and Anderson Mesas. Our analysis confirms a similar increase in the highlands of the Verde Valley. Prior to our survey, very little work had been done to document this fact. The process of aggregation noted in Camp Verde phase is even more obvious with a coalescence of smaller sites surrounding larger sites situated near springs or drainages that probably ran all year long. And these are some of the uh, coalescent areas that we had noted. The increase of field houses and farmsteads and one and two room habitation sites seems to indicate more people were farming in the study area. There is increase in the number of sites aggregated around sites of 12 or more rooms. This was probably due to an expansion of family units on good arable land. In the late Honanki phase, which is this phase here, there is a decrease in the number of sites of all sizes and types, with the exception of those 13 rooms and larger. Once the number of generations are factored in, 
Late Honanke becomes a phase with maximum population. It is well to note that sites considered large in Sycamore Hackberry Basin areas are 13 plus rooms. Aggregation and clustering of sites continues in this phase. There is an area of no building or farming activity between those clusters, but this may be attributed to the fact that some of these areas were not surveyed, but some of the divisions of clusters may be due to natural boundaries of <coughs> canyons or steep ridges, and some probably due to the inhabitants just concentrating around drainages and springs. It is noteworthy that the larger sites are on hilltops or very close to hilltops with line of sights to other pueblos. This verifies the initial thrust of the survey project. Once the room estimates per phase were calculated and we didn't include the field houses as we didn't feel that these were occupied all year long, an adjustment was made for the number of generations per phase. That number of rooms was multiplied by three and five persons per room to develop a population estimate range. As shown on the chart, there is a substantial increase in population between Lake Camp Verde and Lake Honaki with a drop off in early Tuzigoot phase. And this is a Tuzigoot phase, early Tuzigoot phase sees a dramatic decrease, but the larger sites still remain and the sites marked with little flags are the larger sites of 20 plus room Pueblos. Even if people had moved to the larger sites, the decrease in sites of less than eight rooms indicates a loss of population. Small sites are practically non-existent. As you see, they go from 51 to five, and there is little clustering of small sites around larger sites. Trade is shrunk. There is only 17% of the amount of sherds seen in late Honanke the smaller accumulation of shards shows a continuing depopulation of the area. A big question is whether we should show any population remaining in the study area during this phase. The pottery types assigned to this phase could just as well mark the end of early Tuzigoot phase. And because diagnostics in late Tuzigoot phase, AKA Jedito, plainware is found on protohistoric sites as well. The last major trading partner for ceramics was in the Hopi Mesas and Winslow area, as indicated by the Jedito yellow ware and Winslow orange ware. Homolabi was going strong during the Tuzigoot phases, so it would seem logical that some may have migrated in that direction, or there may have been a move to a more dependable source of available water along the Verde River, particularly if they left before AD 1350. Here's some conclusions and summary from our survey. Many archaic, archaic points were found throughout the survey area. So the fact remains that there was a presence before the cloverleaf phase. Hackberry Basin is where the type site for the Hackberry phase is located, but our survey group did not find a site of that type. Jerry talked about racetracks. He said there was three. I don't know, I have four in my database, so one of us is off. Anyways, they're defined, as he mentions, extended linear cleared areas. Um, the racetracks were not all associated with large sites, and these need to be studied more to determine the validity of, of them as actually racetracks and not used for some other activity. From a total of 50, 15,000 sherds analyzed, only three were Hohokam buffware, which would suggest that the Hohokam did not have much presence in the Hackberry Basin area. There were no Roosevelt redwares found, indicating no trade from the diverse peoples that live in the Tonto Basin, referred to as the Salado. Pottery was the main catalyst in understanding the temporal phases. The inference is to who were trading partners and who immigrated to our survey area was based on the pottery found. Decorated pottery verifies that their main trading partners changed through time. Intrusive pottery verifi verifies trade came into Sycamore Canyon, Hackberry Basin, but asked the questions, what goods were being traded in exchange? One likely answer is the mountainous terrain provided an abundance of wild game. And we also identified multiple areas of yucca and agave concentrations in close proximity to habitation sites. And most of the, 
a host of products and foods from these natural resources could be used in trade. During the earlier time phases, we see a settlement pattern of isolated small sites. As time progresses, these small sites cluster around larger pueblos. More rooms indicate a population increase. Eventually, the number of small sites decreases and large sites increase, indicating people are leaving small habitations and moving into larger pueblos. The greatest distance that separates a small site from a large site, large pueblo, is 2.3 kilometers. Most sites are closer, and the distance between large sites averages 3.9 kilometers, and this is very close to the distance between the large sites along the Verde River. The division of the large sites by geographic land barriers can be a way of putting a boundary around their area, but the relatively close proximity of these large pueblos could provide for mutual protection as well. Living in large pueblos allows for greater participation in group functions and social activities. However, aggregation into large pueblos can have its own detrimental effects, even leading to abandonment. This is especially true when it comes to sanitation and spread of disease. Time of stress brought on by drought, lack of food can cause higher mortality rates. Friction between groups can increase and people will leave, looking for new areas to establish themselves and provide for their families. It is a known fact during AD 1250 to 1400, the large sites of homology along the Little Colorado River and larger sites such as Tuzigut site here uh, had a population increase. And these communities might indicate two areas where migration took place. Once Sycamore Canyon and Hackberry Basin was abandoned. The study will continue as more information is needed to fill in the gaps. Terrain that has not been surveyed in our area will be surveyed as well as revisiting some sites to refine our data on pottery. Soil studies are necessary and hydrology information is needed to determine how precipitation affects the recharge of the water tables and springs. Lastly, the value of excavation and gathering information from one or more sites could help confirm or disprove our conclusions. Rather than our survey area being classified as a hinterland, the data shows that trade, population, and land use patterns are the same as the Verde Valley proper. An important void of prehistory of Hackberry Basin, Sycamore Canyon area has been addressed, and continued research will tell us more of the big picture of the Verde Valley. Thank you.